Welcome to the Benzo Free Podcast, your home for an honest, straightforward, and personal discussion about anti-anxiety drugs, their effects, and how to deal with dependence and withdrawal. Whether you have taken benzodiazepines, Z drugs, or any other tranquilizers, know someone who has, or you just want help dealing with chronic anxiety and insomnia, this is your podcast. I'm your host, D.E. Foster, author of the book, Benzo Free, The World of Anti-Anxiety Drugs and the Reality of Withdrawal. I'm so glad you joined us today. Please stick around and let me bend your ear for a few minutes. It just might feel a little better on the other side. Hello there, this is Dee, and welcome to episode 59 of the Benzo Free Podcast. It's good to be back in the studio talking with you today. You know, one thing that is nice about hosting this podcast is that different people reach out to me. This past week, I had a pharmacist and PhD candidate from the Royal College of Surgeons in Ireland contact me, and we had a chance to speak on the phone this week. His name is Tom Lynch, and he is working on a research study which aims to develop a strategy to assist people who want help reducing or discontinuing benzodiazepines or Z drugs. And since we need the research, I was happy to try to help out. Now, this study is limited at this time and is only open to people living in the Republic of Ireland who are currently taking or who have recently withdrawn from these drugs. If this fits you and you would like to be involved, please contact Tom. His contact info is in our show notes. If you are unsure if you want to be involved but just want more info, feel free to contact me and I can provide you some more background. Thanks, Tom, for taking this on. And if you're interested in the study, please reach out to him and learn more. My symptoms have been a bit stronger lately, I have to admit. My facial paresthesia has returned along with occasional insomnia and my cognitive dysfunction, memory loss, and of course my chronic abdominal discomfort. Those are still hanging on. But you know, I can't blame all of those on stress. One of the downfalls of healing, of feeling better after this benzo crisis, of getting back out into life again, is that it's so easy to forget the tools and especially the discipline which got us here. When we start feeling better, the consequences of bad decisions, well, they aren't quite as severe, and it's easy to overlook them and do stupid things and get busy and forget to remember what got you here. And that is what I've been doing lately. I've let a few things go. I still meditate, but not as often. I haven't been to yoga in several months. Finding time to exercise has been like pulling teeth for me lately. And then there's my diet. (laughs) I can eat sugar again, and I don't have the severe consequences I had before, but there are consequences. My diet has sucked lately. (laughs) I've been gaining some weight, and I have absolutely no one else to blame but myself. In fact, I think my diet is the primary factor of my ongoing abdominal distress, along with the pelvic floor dysfunction from benzo withdrawal. As so many of us have done, we get busy. And finding time to exercise, to eat right, to take a yoga class, to meditate seems difficult. I I remember the old adage, dance with the one who brung you. Well, those things that brung me to my healthy stage right now, I've been ignoring them lately. (laughs) And it's time I made a change. I'm sharing this with you today, well, primarily because I share just about everything with you. (laughs) Maybe a bit too much, but it's what I do. But mostly because I know some of you who have started feeling better are having the same struggles too. Now, compared to being back in the middle of withdrawal, This should be a cakewalk, shouldn't it? And that perhaps is the reminder we may need. These tools we have developed which got us to this place are key, not just for those struggling with acute withdrawal, but for anyone who wants to live a more healthy and happy life. 
The good news for me is that many of my anxiety and other mental tools are still strong in keeping me positive and happy most of the time. But I can't forget my body. So let me know if this is a struggle for you too, especially for those who have started to feel a little bit better. I'm curious what you are struggling with as you return to what we might call a more normal pace of life. And I also did want to mention one more thing um, before we close out the introduction here, something that I know is on the minds of many of you lately, and that is the coronavirus. Now, I don't talk much about news on this podcast, and that is mostly by intention. News is a stressor and instigator of anxiety for so many of us, so I find it's good to detach during our recovery as we're healing. Still, some news stories are hard to avoid. And when you combine news like this with our irrational brain functioning during acute withdrawal, it can be a recipe for disaster, of fear, worry, and frantic overreaction. This is a serious outbreak of a virus, but it is also not the first one we've experienced. Remember SARS, MERS, the bird flu? We've been here before, with even more lethal viruses than this one. Anyway, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail here, but I do beg you to try and keep things in perspective as best as you can. You know, Jennifer Lee, who many of you have spoken with and who we have had as an early guest on this podcast, wrote a wonderful blog post about benzos this week and how to manage the fear of this virus. You might want to check it out. I'll put a link in our show notes. But please just keep in mind to take care of yourself. And that means also to take care of your mental state and your worry and your anxiety. Watching the news all the time focusing on the horrors that you think are going on around you rarely helps this process. Sometimes it's okay to detach for a while and take care of yourself. Today we have an abbreviated format starting with our introduction, which you just heard, followed by our Benzo story, feature, and our moment of peace. There is no mailbag today since our feature is basically an extended mailbag section all by itself. Today's feature is questions, comments, and a few answers about benzodependence and withdrawal. We did something similar back in episode 34 of the podcast, and it was a success. So I thought it was time to revisit that format again. I rummaged through some of our more recent and a few not-so-recent questions and comments from you, the listeners, and put them in today's episode, along with a few quick and not-so-quick answers. I hope you like it. And before we move on, don't forget we need your help. We need feedback of any kind we truly want to hear from you. You can provide feedback in four ways. Comment directly on one of our podcasts or blog posts so others can see. Fill out our feedback form at benzofree.org slash feedback. Email us at podcast at benzofree.org. Or leave feedback on one of our podcast carriers so others can find us. While you are on the website, don't forget to sign up for our mailing list at benzofree.org slash subscribe. And if you wish to help support what we do here, you can visit our donations page at benzofree.org slash donate. Trust me, every little bit helps what we do. And don't forget... The Benzo Free Podcast is for informational purposes only and should never be considered medical advice. Now, let's take a look at our Benzo story. Our story today is from Caroline in the United Kingdom. I started hearing from Caroline in November of last year, and we've been writing back and forth steadily since then. She even sent me a picture of her late cat, and I sent her a couple of pictures of Bear. She is doing so much to help her recovery, researches like crazy, and has an irrepressible spirit that carries through. I do want to put a trigger warning on this story, though. Caroline has had a tough go of it and has some detailed descriptions of depersonalization, derealization, hallucinations, and even possible seizure. I do recommend that if hearing stories of distress of this type are a trigger for you, that you skip the story and move on to the feature. Remember that we have a time index in our show notes, which will help you find what you're looking for. But that being said, much like all the stories we share here, Caroline's story 
is a very important one to hear, and some of you will connect with her struggles. Caroline writes, My tale isn't the usual. I do take blame a bit too much on myself thinking about it now. I got dependent on a Z drug probably from day one. No two to four weeks for me. I, I would have had severe withdrawal from day one. I got maybe seven pills. I can't recall and desperately needed more after for what I thought was a rebound, but insufferable insomnia at first. I researched them before I got them, thought about it a lot, then plunged in. It said not addictive. I looked at several different resources online, in medical journals, on the information sheet from a real chemist online where I got them, and thought, okay, it'll be all right. My goodness, I was wrong. And trapped. I stayed on them for years as I couldn't get off. In short, I got tolerant. My dose escalated and I started to mess up badly in the day. I also had severe stomach cramps, which I didn't relate to the Z drugs at all. I also had what must have been inner dose withdrawal. I distinctly recall breathing into a bag as I had what I think was a panic attack at the train station. I was crying. It was awful. I felt like a junkie. No one would help me as I was too far gone kind of thing. I lost a good job, although it had issues. And all the fallout from that, which I didn't need in midlife. Finally, I went to a drug group, and they also said Zopaclone wasn't addictive. Then I went elsewhere and to another GP. I'd already moved into diazepam myself, and she prescribed a clean supply of diazepam, but tapered too quickly, I now realize. I am now in acute withdrawal after stopping. I'm trying to tolerate the withdrawal, but I bet it's a lot harder as the taper has been too fast. I have a myriad of severe and long-lasting symptoms, including hallucinations, you know, writing on my leg, I, I've had this before in withdrawal and it's now gone, and perception distortions. I mistook some coat hangers on my curtain rail as a Spider-Man of all things. I don't have a psychotic illness. Underneath this is all withdrawal. I have been here a number of times when I've tried to cold turkey myself under no supervision, so I know the lay of the land somewhat. I've seen the weird Sanskrit writing before. God only knows what language it is. I've never seen it prior. Something akin to hieroglyphics or old ancient writings. I've had varying degrees of this perception weirdness in withdrawal and I stopped any future rapid or cold turkey-ish attempts after collapsing in one attempt to cold turkey and went over the edge in my mind to complete depersonalization. I was elsewhere in a cave under a rocky mountain in Mexico, to be precise. Goodness knows why Mexico. I have no real interest in the place. I, I never had even looked it up. It wasn't good. I even went to some kind of God's waiting room in my delusion as well. It oscillated between that and hell, and some other crazy dreamlike thing with people jet skiing to loud music on a chocolate river. The people were also chocolate. I awoke to a gentle breeze and the fluttering of a hospital curtain in the ICU unit of a hospital. No recollection of getting there or anything. I jumped thinking the same characters were going to appear with their needles and drugs, but no, thank God. Just a funny doctor with a rubbish bedside manner who asked me, do you know where you are? I said, no. He showed me. I said, ah, I see. I knew my name and date of birth, but my memory was really wiped. I lost memory for months. I'm digressing, as it's a bit of an unusual one, maybe, and may interest you. It's all true, every word. It was an interesting experience in a way, but not one I'd like to repeat. I probably nearly died, and I shouldn't take it lightly. Yes, I sound totally bananas, I know, but I'm not. 
This was all perception distortion. I was also given antibiotics in ICU, and it looked like I had sepsis, as I had a rash, low blood pressure, a UTI, and tachycardia. I was unaware I was in the hospital, let alone taken there. All I recall is collapsing and falling into some type of sleep, thinking, this is it. I'm dead. I went back on the Z drugs shortly after as I couldn't cope, had major things to do in the wake of the impending loss of job and home, and put off withdrawal until six months later, which I've done via my GP this time. Somewhat safer, but still it's been too fast, and I'm suffering, but trying to get through it to the other side. Your podcasts keep me going and I've gone further and harder than I ever have before. I'm getting some sleep now, not a lot, but some. My main disabling symptom is abdominal pain, and this makes it hard to sleep as well, and exacerbates the depression and hopelessness. Weirdly, my mood seems somewhat better. It would be pleasurable if I wasn't in so much pain in my abdomen. I have a renewed sense of what I can only call being alive, it seems. Like it's something special, I can't describe it. I just wish the abdominal pain would start easing a bit more so I have more faith things will improve. I love that you said in one of your podcasts it would be nice also to hear some positives as well. Yet, you do and always are so wonderfully careful to balance every word, sentence, and podcast to be like a wonderful, healthful tincture of hope. I also enjoy the moment of peace. I had one with a sea noise on it, and it was truly wonderful. I, I'm not a meditator. I normally poo-poo such ideas and practices, but I did it, and I do the meditations now in the moment of peace. I look forward to them. I smile as they approach, and also, on your hello at the beginning makes me do a little smile of humor. We need that in withdrawal to lighten up a bit. I shall end it there for now, and just say sincerely and plainly thank you. All the best in love and kindness, Caroline. In January, Caroline wrote a few more sentences as an update, and I wanted to share it with you. She said, I am now about two months out and realize this takes so much longer than the 21 days the doctor tells me and a lot of the withdrawal timelines out there. It's almost never mentioned, as you probably know all too well. I am determined to stay the course. All the best, Caroline. Thank you, Caroline. What an amazing story. I I'm so glad you are still with us after all you have been through. We haven't talked much about depersonalization, derealization, and perceptual distortions, hallucinations much on this podcast, but they are a factor of benzo withdrawal for some, mostly in people who have withdrawn too fast, like Caroline. I know Caroline's story is a hard one to hear, but it's one I really wanted to tell because she shares a side of this experience which we can't shy away from. This is part of the experience for some people and we shouldn't be afraid to talk about it. Caroline has done us a huge favor here and reintroduced a topic which we have not addressed in a while. DPDR and other distortions can be some of the most terrifying symptoms during benzo withdrawal, and one we will need to address in more detail in upcoming podcasts. I am so glad you are benzo free, and I hope we can continue our friendship via email for many months to come. Thank you for your courage. And don't forget, we still need stories, so please send them in when and if you'd like to share. Now, let's move on to our feature. Our feature today are questions about benzos. As I mentioned in the intro, it's basically an extended version of our mailbag. Most of them based on questions and even a few comments from you, our listeners. Some of our answers discussions will be brief, some, well, not quite so brief, but I hope it's informative and even occasionally entertaining nonetheless. 
Thanks to everyone for sending these in, and please keep them coming. As I've said before, and I'll keep saying, you make this podcast what it is, and I am truly grateful. Thanks. The first one I want to touch on is from, well, me. <laughs> Actually, it's, it's one that I've heard discussed much of late, but I can't attribute it to one person here today for the podcast. Thus, it's going to be from me. And the question is this, what the hell do you call this condition we have anyway? <laughs> well, D, I'm glad you asked that question. <laughs> Why am I talking about this? Because it's important, very important. Consistent terminology is key if we want what we are going through to be recognized by the medical community and general public. This syndrome, this condition, this illness that so many of us have goes by many names. It just depends on who you ask as to what it is. I'm going to list a few of the names here, maybe a few more than a few, just so you kind of get an idea of what we're talking about. So let's take a brief stroll down the path of terminology that has been used to describe this condition so many of us share. Let's start off with the first big two, which are benzo withdrawal syndrome or benzodiazepine withdrawal syndrome, BWS, and protracted withdrawal syndrome or PWS. But that's just the tip of the iceberg. How about protracted benzodiazepine withdrawal syndrome, protracted abstinence syndrome, Pharmacological benzodiazepine withdrawal syndrome, prolonged benzodiazepine syndrome, post-withdrawal syndrome, post-acute withdrawal syndrome, persistent withdrawal syndrome, benzodiazepine-induced withdrawal syndrome, benzodiazepine use disorder, benzodiazepine receptor agonist use disorder, benzo injury syndrome, benzodiazepine injury syndrome, benzodiazepine injury, benzo brain injury, benzo brain injury syndrome. Benzodiazepine Neurological Injury Syndrome, Discontinuation Syndrome, Iatrogenic Illness, Iatrogenic Syndrome, Iatrogenic Withdrawal Syndrome, Pharmacological Iatrogenic Syndrome, Benzodiazepine Iatrogenic Injury Syndrome. And of course, the terms we truly cringe at when we hear, Benzodiazepine Addiction or Benzo Addiction, Benzodiazepine Abuse, benzodiazepine use disorder, benzodiazepine substance use disorder, and there are so many others. <laughs> this is confusing. And just so you know, all the terms that I've just read through are actually in published articles or literature or papers on the internet. These aren't just ones I've heard in passing. In the Ashton Manual, our beloved professor never actually uses the term benzodiazepine withdrawal syndrome. I thought she did, but I went back and looked. It's not in there. She does use benzodiazepine withdrawal throughout her manual, and often protracted withdrawal, and even protracted withdrawal syndrome. In fact, even in her writings, the nomenclature changed. She wrote a paper in 1991 titled, Protracted Withdrawal Syndrome from Benzodiazepines, and followed it up in a paper in 1995 titled, Protracted Withdrawal from Benzodiazepines, the Post-Withdrawal Syndrome. Hmm. It gets confusing, doesn't it? In my book, I use the terms Benzodiazepine Withdrawal Syndrome, BWS, and Protracted Withdrawal Syndrome, PWS, most frequently, since those were the terms used most often in the literature I had researched. But that leaves us wondering, is that the proper term we should be using going forward? And the answer is, it depends again on who you ask. So where do I come down on this topic? Well, I'm sure I'll continue to use BWS and PWS in some of my writing, but I'm tending to see the logic in moving in the direction of injury, the term injury. Benzo injury syndrome or benzodiazepine injury syndrome is gaining some traction lately, and I understand why. The main problem, I think, with the original terminology is the word withdrawal. As we attempt to steer discussions away from that of addiction and towards that of dependence, the term withdrawal becomes an issue, since it's so closely tied with addiction. Thus, as you well know, I'm not a medical expert, so I have no idea what I'm talking about here, but 
I personally would lean towards benzo injury syndrome. And maybe even benzo dependence syndrome or benzo dependence injury syndrome, but maybe just benzo injury syndrome is the simplest of them all. Now, the real question I want to ask is who decides? I'm sure it ain't me, so who makes this decision? Is there somebody in the APA or AMA that makes these decisions? I really don't know. But I know it's not me. <laughs> I'm just kind of giving my opinions here and stating that this is creating some confusion. And it does create confusion when we try to share our message outside of the benzo community. So it might be something that we finally figure out. I don't know. Let's move on to our next one. This next one is a question from Graham in the United Kingdom. Graham writes, I hate it that you've been on this rocky road for so long, and I'd love to get to the bottom of why this happens to some and not to others. I read from NICE, the National Institute for Health and Care Excellence in the UK, that the expected recovery time is 6 to 18 months. I will be north of that, I think, but at 15 months, I have a chance to just sneak in. But I have a feeling that this will linger for years to come, on a diminished trend like it has for you, although my line on the graph seems to be below yours. So there must be a calculation that predicts the recovery length and maybe its intensity. It would go something like 6 plus A plus B plus C plus etc where six months is the minimum length that everyone gets or something. Then A could equal the additional length for each drug, such as clonopin, ativan, etc. B could equal the additional length if you are on one or more drug. C could equal age, D, sex, E, ethnicity, F, fitness, and so on. Do you know if anyone is doing this kind of work? This is a great question from Graham. Thanks for sending that in. Determining the length and severity of benzo withdrawal is something every single one of us would like to know. Unfortunately, it's one we are still far from understanding. The truth is, there are just so many variables. Yes, type of drug, length on drug, dosage of drug, age, sex, ethnicity, fitness, just as you said, may be factors. But there are so many more, such as other medications. So many people are taking two, three, five, even eight or nine meds at once. Each one of these can affect your symptomology and recovery and have their own complications and symptoms too. Diet can be a big one. We are learning more and more as to the close connection between the brain and gut. And since there are a significant amount of GABA receptors in the digestive system, it just complicates the whole scenario. Counseling can help. And the development of tools to manage your anxiety, which we talk about often on this podcast, can be a significant factor in your recovery. Ashton spoke of this learning deficit that happens when we are on the drugs and that creates an educational vacuum that we need to compensate for once we are healed. And, and what about environment? Do you work in a stressful job? Is home stressful? Do you have a personal or medical support system? The truth is, it's all so subjective. When we deal with medicine, especially psychiatric medicine, any scientific study must face one hard truth. It's all subjective. Do you feel pain the same way I do? Do you experience anxiety the same way I do? What do you mean by disoriented? Is it the same as I mean? What do you mean by brain fog? Is it the same thing I experience? What do you mean by healed or recovered? Is it a complete 100%? What about 99% or 95%? What if you feel healed and then a year later you have a small wave of symptoms? What if you still have some anxiety ongoing in the background? I think your question is an excellent one, Graham, <laughs> and we probably will get some estimates over time with ongoing research, but medicine is not an exact science despite what we think. 
and estimating a person's recovery time from benzodependence may always be a crapshoot of sorts. That's why I try to focus more on the journey here on the podcast and doing all you can to develop tools to help you through this trying time. Because if you continue to focus on the goal line and that goal line continues to move, then you are setting yourself up for a very difficult time of it. Some of us have no serious complications at all when they withdraw. And I envy them. I'm sure most of us do. Others have some symptomology, but they fade quickly after their last dose. And others have some ongoing symptomology, like me and some of you. One thing we do know is that a slow taper and proper withdrawal management per the Ashton Manual and under doctor supervision can go a long way towards making this whole experience much easier to bear. God, I wish there was an answer for this. And trust me, I've tried to kind of do the math in my head too, just like you did, Graham. <laughs> but after I figured out all the variables that could be in play, I realized I don't know if it'll ever be solved. We'll probably get some estimates at some time to say, like, you know, you mentioned NICE said six to 18 months, but I don't know that we'll ever have a definitive and I don't know if we'll ever have a calculation or a formula. Wouldn't that be nice? I just don't know if it'll happen. Thanks for the question, Graham. I really appreciate it. This next one is from Audrey in England. Audrey writes, Thank you for all the information. Can I ask a question? Been on diazepam for six months. The diazepam are five milligrams. I have 10 diazepam each month. Could I be dependent? Thank you. Well, thanks, Audrey. Many people ask about what it takes to truly become dependent on these drugs. And the truth is, it varies person to person. Again, not a solid answer here. I'm so sorry. <laughs> Most medical groups recommend that benzodiazepines not be prescribed long term of continuous use with two to four weeks usually as the cutoff. Have some people become dependent sooner than that time frame? Yes, it appears so. There are some people who claim they have become dependent in as little as 11 days, 7 days, even less. But it is rare. Here's the thing, just as I said in the last question. There are so many factors, thousands of factors, that determine whether a person will become dependent, and if they do, what their symptomology and withdrawal will be like. Genetics disposition, support systems, mental history, environment, stress levels, and on and on. Also, one of the key factors with Audrey is that she did not take it continuously. She said she only took 10 5 milligram pills a month, which is not necessarily continuous. So the chances of Audrey being dependent on this drug, I'd like to say unlikely, but the truth is, and I got to say it again, I'm not a medical expert, so this is just my opinion, and I'm guessing here. One thing I would suggest you watch for is interdose symptomology. If you are having difficulty between doses and symptoms arise and get worse during this time, then it is possible you might be dependent. But the good news is that 5 milligrams of diazepam is not a lot. I wish you the best, and please work with your doctor if you decide that you want to stop taking this medication. Thanks for the question, Audrey. This question was asked from a friend of ours just this past week. Of course, you know when I say a friend, it's because the person who submitted it would rather remain anonymous. Our friend writes, I really enjoyed the podcast on talking with your doctor, but what if they still don't believe you? What if she says you can take them the rest of your life and won't help you? What then? Thanks. Unfortunately, there are still many doctors who don't believe that long-term benzodiazepine use or Z drug use can cause physiological dependence and who aren't educated on slow withdrawal procedures such as the Ashton Manual. We are working on changing this, but it is a fact, and it is unfortunate. So, as our friend asked, how do we convince these people? 
Well, in my opinion, the answer is diligence and patience. We keep showing them the evidence, especially evidence from medical colleagues in reputable journals, which doctors tend to believe. Over time, attitudes do change. But in the meantime, what can we do as the patients? Now, first off, the episode this person was referring to was episode number 57, titled Tips for Talking About Benzos with Doctors, Therapists, Family, and Friends. In that episode, we did include a lot of links to handouts and one sheets from BIC, WBAD, The Alliance, and several other excellent benzo organizations. Some with some excellent quotes and studies backing up our claims. Here at Benzo Free, we are also developing some of our own one sheets for various scenarios like you mentioned, which will add to the availability of useful literature. But doctors can be very difficult to convince. I know they are, especially if you're not another doctor. Still, it's worth a try. While I cannot provide any medical advice here at all, I can tell you that most experts agree that a slow taper under doctor supervision is the most effective method for reducing your medication. Our next item is a comment from Tony in Belgium. Tony writes, after my second night of sleeping with the CPAP device that blows air in my nose so I can't stop breathing during my sleep, I slept for eight hours and probably deeply. I awakened again without muscle pain and exhaustion as it was before. I'm still tired, but doctors have told me it can take some months to refine the old forces. I'm astonished on the interest to find so many reports about untreatable depressive persons. Up to 40% just seem to suffer apnea without knowing. I always thought apnea is just provoking snoring, but now I know more. Apnea leads year by year to suffocation in general. The lack of oxygen drops constantly and prevents from going into deep sleep. Taking antidepressants and benzos worsens the sleep. They are a burden and can prevent you from getting into stage three of the sleeping cycle, the deep sleep, that makes us recover. You remember I was severely depressed in February 11th when I heard the news of my apnea. Now I have hope again to recover. I will never take benzos and the other stuff. In the sleep clinic, the doctor told me about a patient they recently had, 10 years blocked in psychiatry. Only now they discovered sleep apnea was the cause. I don't know if you ever heard about the relationship between apnea and depression. Apnea provokes exhaustion. Exhaustion provokes depression. Apnea should be treated and not neglected. Up to 10% of the population may suffer from apnea, but most don't know. Thanks, Tony. When Tony wrote this to me last week, I knew we needed to cover it on the podcast. While we have talked about insomnia as a withdrawal symptom, lack of REM and SWS sleep with benzo use, and even breathing difficulties, we never really took a look at the possibility of sleep apnea being a factor. Tony was nice enough to let me share his email here, and I thought we might talk about this for a minute or two. First off, let's look at sleep apnea. Sleep apnea is when breathing is briefly and repeatedly interrupted during sleep, with pauses lasting at least 10 seconds. There are two types of sleep apnea. Obstructive sleep apnea, OSA, which is the most common, and occurs when the muscles in the back of the throat fail to keep the airway open despite efforts to breathe. Central sleep apnea, CSA, is when the brain fails to properly control breathing during sleep. According to the National Sleep Foundation, over 18 million American adults have sleep apnea, but only 20% have been diagnosed and treated. And it occurs in all age groups and sexes. Around one in five adults have mild symptoms of OSA, while one in 15 have moderate to severe symptoms. There are several factors that can increase risk of sleep apnea, including being overweight, 
smoking and alcohol use, age, having a small upper airway, recessed chin, large neck size, and possible genetic factors. Many of the signs of sleep apnea are similar to that of benzodiazepine dependence, including sleeplessness, difficulty concentrating, depression, irritability, sexual dysfunction, and learning and memory difficulties. Untreated sleep apnea can lead to heart disease, hypertension, depression, and can increase the risk of daytime drowsiness leading to accidents and lack of productivity. Diagnosis usually involves a sleep study, and the most common treatment is a CPAP device or continuous positive airway pressure device. There are some other treatment options, including dental appliances, surgery, nerve stimulation, and a few others. But in reality, lifestyle changes are often effective in mitigating some of the symptoms, including losing weight, avoiding alcohol, quitting smoking, and sleeping on your side, among others. So that's the lowdown on sleep apnea. Now, what does this have to do with benzodiazepines, you may ask? <laughs> well, a lot, actually. According to a study published in the American Journal of Medicine titled Benzodiazepines, Breathing, and Sleep, the author stated the following, quote, Although the benzodiazepines may reduce sleep fragmentation, their long-term use may also cause health problems, such as complete obstructive sleep apnea in heavy snores, or short repetitive central sleep apnea in patients with recent myocardial infarction. These sedative hypnotic drugs adversely affect your brain's ability to control and regulate breathing as you sleep. If you already have sleep apnea, this practically guarantees the severity of your disorder will worsen. An article published on the website for the American Sleep Apnea Association in conjunction with WBAD was titled, World Benzodiazepine Awareness Day, Sleep Apnea and Anxiety Drugs Do Not Mix. In that article, the author added, Benzos are associated with poor tone in the muscles of the upper airway, even in people without sleep breathing disorders. This can lead to troubling problems in which the brain doesn't respond quickly enough to imbalances of oxygen and carbon dioxide in the bloodstream. Now, breathing issues during sleep have been known as a common symptom of benzodependence and withdrawal for some time, but it is often overlooked. I struggled with this during my withdrawal, and on some occasions woke up gasping for air, in addition to occasional bouts of air hunger. Mine did ease as I healed, and I haven't had those problems in some time, but they were frightening when they happened. Benzos can affect your breathing, and it's something to be aware of and to monitor. Please speak with your doctor if you are concerned. Now, this can become an even more serious problem when people combine benzos with opioids. 30% of all overdose deaths involving opioids also involve benzodiazepines. In fact, the Food and Drug Administration in the U.S. issued a black box warning, their strongest warning in 2016, warning of the concurrent use of opioids and benzodiazepines. I wrote the following sentence in my book about this topic. Respiratory depression, also known as hypoventilation, is when breathing is too low or slow to provide adequate gas exchange, which increases the amount of carbon dioxide in the blood. It's the opposite of hyperventilation, in which you breathe too fast and get too much oxygen in the blood. As humans, we need a balance of oxygen and carbon dioxide. And when we get out of balance, bad things can happen. When benzos are combined with street drugs or prescription painkillers such as cocaine, heroin, or others, this respiratory depression can become fatal. Most benzos are effective sedatives and muscle relaxants, which can be too effective when combined with other drugs. This combined effect can relax the body so much that breathing becomes too slow 
and too shallow. Due to this effect, benzos are contraindicated in people with obstructive sleep apnea, myasthenia gravis, bronchitis, COPD, and chronic pulmonary disease. So, back to the comment from Tony. Benzo's sleeping and breathing difficulties have been known issues for some time, and this definitely can carry over into complications with or even possible causing both OSA, obstructive sleep apnea, and CSA, central sleep apnea. As you heal, these symptoms should begin to correct themselves, but how long that might take, we really don't know. As for the depression, as Tony said, there is a definite link. According to a 2017 study published in Sleep Medicine and Disorders International Journal, the author stated the following in the conclusion. It has been well established through various studies that there is an association between OSA and depression. Patients with OSA have impaired health, and their psychosocial health and daily performance also decrease. Now, I could go on and on, and it seems like I already have, but the truth is there is a lot more information to share. But I'm going to stop for now. We'll probably revisit this again not too long from now. If you are concerned that breathing is an issue while you sleep, please get it checked out. Check with your doctor, get a sleep test if you need to, and find ways of making sure that you are getting the oxygen you need during such a critical time of healing. Our next question is from Melanie. Melanie asks, This is my first time writing you. I'm a week shy of tapering steadily for one year off Alprazolam. I was prescribed 3 to 4 milligrams for 20 years. Needless to say, my central nervous system is all aboard the struggle bus. I'm currently at 0.87 milligrams a day, needing to hold for a while. Trying to tell myself that it's okay. This is not a race, but I really want my life back. I want my brain back. I recently joined a support group that centers around any chronic illness. I'm not sure if I belong there, and I'm not sure what they think of me. I do not blame them, as hardly anyone understands what benzo withdrawal is about. I'm not sure if I should stick with it. I know it's working my brain to get out of the house. I'm so shattered physically afterwards. Everything hurts from head to toe. I try to explain this, but I get the weird looks, and I know you understand the ones I mean. Is benzo withdrawal a chronic illness exactly? I was curious to hear your thoughts. Thank you for all you do. I really like the positivity podcast you did. It made me cry, but in a good way. Thanks again, Melanie. Well, thanks, Melanie. I really wanted to share Melanie's email and discuss this topic a bit. I guess there are actually two topics here. Is benzo withdrawal a chronic illness? And can support groups help this process? So first, the chronic illness. The definition for a chronic illness varies a bit by source, but basically it means an illness that persists over a long period of time. So that answer is easy. Yes, benzodependence and withdrawal can be considered a chronic illness for those who suffer its effects over a period of time. This usually means over three months or longer, according to the National Cancer Institute. Now, on to part two, support groups. Now, there are some in-person benzodiazepine-specific support groups in the U.S., U.K., and some other countries. I've communicated with a few of them, but unfortunately, they are few and far between. Most of us are left with online support groups or discussion groups or attending other support groups which may not cater specifically to our condition. When I was in the midst of my withdrawal, I attended an Al-Anon group for a while. This is the sister group to Alcoholics Anonymous, and it supports people who have an alcoholic or they call qualifier in their lives. This was true in my case, so I attended. I found the support group beneficial and stayed with it for about nine months. 
This was a place to share your story and struggles in an open environment. Their message focused on self-responsibility and, and focusing on oneself and changes you can make rather than getting your qualifier to change, which was a principle I could truly embrace. Thus, I worked on myself in those meetings, found a few friends, and got some support. Over time, though, I saw that it did not really meet my needs related to benzo withdrawal. And for a variety of reasons, which I won't go into here, I became less comfortable in the group and stopped attending. Melanie brings up an excellent point in her email. We want, more than anything, to be surrounded by people who understand us and understand what we are going through. Benzo withdrawal is such a unique beast, one which no one else really gets who hasn't been through it. And thus, we reach out to others to help us through this trying time. I hope to help promote more in-person support groups through BenzoFree. If anyone knows of one in their area or hosts one or is thinking about hosting one, please let me know. I'd like to work with you and even post a new page on the website dedicated to these groups and helping others find them. Thanks, Melanie, for the question, and take care. And that wraps up our feature. I hope you enjoyed our little jaunt through our mailbag today for the feature. I, I love hearing from each and every one of you, and sharing your questions, comments, suggestions, and stories makes this all worthwhile. Thanks for those, and please keep them coming in. And now, before we get to our moment of peace, please bear with me for just about 30 seconds for our disclaimer. This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be considered medical advice in any way. The host of this podcast is not a medical professional, nor is he engaged in rendering medical health or psychological advice nor any other kind of personal professional services. The views and opinions expressed by our listeners and interview guests on this podcast, whether read from textual submissions or presented in their own voice, do not necessarily reflect those of the Benza Free podcast or of its host. Withdrawal tapering or any other change in dosage of benzodiazepines, non-benzodiazepines, or any other prescription drugs should only be done under the direct supervision of a licensed physician. Our full disclaimer can be viewed on our website at benzofree.org slash disclaimer. And that brings us to our closing, our moment of peace. It's just one minute, and it's an opportunity to quiet your mind a bit before you return to the chaos of the real world. Please remember that you should only do this if you are in a safe place, where you can close your eyes, relax, and let the world pass by without you for a minute. Today we are going to return to a slightly different type, one we did several months ago, and that is a walking meditation. If you are currently in a seated position and prefer to do a sitting meditation, that is fine. Just find a mantra or something to focus on that works for you. While sitting meditation is the most common form of this practice, walking meditation may be a close second. It's quite simple, actually. And although there are a variety of forms, we're going to stick with a basic one today. First, all you need to do is find a safe place to walk. It can be on the sidewalk, on a trail, or, or even in your own home. You start this process by walking slowly and deliberately. And fix your gaze in front of you so you can see oncoming hazards. Feel free to add a mantra if you like, such as, so hum. Or perhaps do a listening meditation and listen to the sounds around you without naming them or any judgment. And then continue walking. That's it. Let's get started. Take a deep breath in. 
Hold it for a second. And let it out slowly. Let's do that again. Take a deep breath in. Hold it for a second. And let it out slowly along with all the stress of the day. One more time. Take a deep breath in. Hold it for a second. And let it out slowly, relaxing your entire body. Now just breathe slowly and naturally. And start walking if you haven't already. If your mind wanders, just gently bring it back to your point of focus. No judgment. Continue to do this for one minute. Our next episode is episode 60, and it will be released next Wednesday. Thank you again for joining me today, and please, let us know how we did. We'd love to hear from you. Keep calm, taper slowly, and take care of yourself. I'll see you next time.